67. Um, I think we'll start uh, the poetry now. So our co-hosts for the evening, we have uh, Diane Pecoraro and Susan Bucket. So I think Diane will be coming forward. Eat, drink, and be merry. Um, this is a night of co's, co-hosts, co-sponsors, and collaboration amongst readers to create community. That's really what we have hoped to do with the community, Friends of the Arts, and with um, these poetry readings. So people in the park will get to know each other and talk to each other, those of you who write poetry, who read poetry, who love poetry. That's what we're about. So tonight's process, I'll be hosting for a little while, and then Susan Booted will take over. Susan is a person who's been very active in poetry. She's an active writer. Some of you may know her and have read or heard her poetry as well. We're going to take the poems about mental health themes. Some kind of divine angel dropped into my lap when I was reading the Sunday New York Times. Tracy Smith is the poet laureate of the United States, and some of you may know her work. It's very, very good work, very straightforward, and on many issues that we are all concerned about. In the second paragraph, again, divine intervention, if you believe in such things, it says, Smith was on the leg, second leg of a multi-state journey she is undertaking as the poet laureate of the United States, officially abbreviated as PLOTUS. Plotus, poet laureate. I love it. I want it to be a Plotus. The role is open to interpretation, working under the auspices of the National Library of Congress. She is taking poetry on the road around the nation. Quote, this is a strange period where nationally we're being reminded or convinced of the great divisions that separate coastal and urban communities from the central and rural communities she said as we started out. At 46, with wide brown eyes and springy curls, she is calm and authoritative. I've always distrusted that, she continued. I think there are a lot of places where we have something very clear, compelling, and welcome to say to one another. The med meditative state of mind a poem induces, she believes, can be a rehumanizing force, an antidote to the din of daily life in which our phones continuously buzz with news alerts, perfectly algorithm to reinforce our biases. More than anything now, I'm looking for the kind of silence that yields clarity, she told me. I'm interested in the way our voices sound when we dip below the decibel level of politics. To Smith, poetry is a shortcut to honest conversation a way of getting past small talk, to probe the spots where our culture is most sore. Literature allows us to be open, to listen, and to be curious. The poem I'm going to read is an old poem of mine, and it's actually a rhyme also. Um, I wrote it for a colleague of mine, and it was called To Brian for a Lost in the Dark Wood Time. And the reference was to a Dante, the Dante Inferno, Inferno that begins with, um, in the middle of my life, I went into a dark wood. And it was about his um, descent into a kind of depression. So my colleague at work was in a very bad, very, very bad funk. And um, was more than a funk that went on for a very long time. So I wrote a poem to him one day a very light poem, but I think you'll get the point. To be, for a lost in the dark wood time. Although we prefer our days filled with tickles, we're old enough to know there are plenty of prickles, snakes and darkness, and here and there a dragon, enough to make you want to hitch up your wagon or ride off into the sunset on a motorbike, enough of this daily putting a finger in the dike and losing your spirit and self-identity to dueling inner voices that might or might not be. So what's a middle-aged person to do handed such confusion? One answer is to float 
for a while with this very uncomfortable intrusion, but allow only a limited time to thrash about and wallow, then drink a liney for firm resolve, down it in one swallow. See yourself in a new light, let others you know reflect it. Recapture your oldest self, certainly don't reject it. Fantasize a long lunch, either with Deneuve or with Keaton. Stiffen your spine, hoist a sail, and refuse, above all, to be eaten. <laughs> and the last line became my own mantra. You know, after I wrote it, for years after, when I went into some kind of something, stew, let's call it, whatever that stew was, I would say, refuse, above all, to be eaten. Um, so on to the readers. Our first reader is Catherine Droz. I'm here. You're here. I usually write in rhymed verse. This is not necessarily rhymed. <clears throat> Labels. What is a label? a best fit analytical calculation of a category with a very specific set of characteristics, traits, and tendencies towards certain behaviors. A human being is. A human being is fill in the blank. An adjective. Good, bad, maybe ugly. These are judgments. A human being is. We teach parents to separate the person from the action. Have you heard that? Not bad child, but the child has done, done something wrong. Not even good girl, but rather, I really like the way you did that. You are so good, so kind, so brave. A human being is. A human being does. A label can help professionals communicate with each other to help someone. A label can help a professional teach the client, patient, about an illness. But labels can get mixed up in our speech, in our communication, in our heads. <clears throat> Who am I? I am a woman with a label. The label describes a chemical imbalance that I have. I am not a label. As a psychotherapist, I wrote an entire thesis on my disorder. Many of us in our profession do. Over halfway through, I realized that I myself had endorsed the stigma. I then wrote, in the chapter on stigma, I wrote, how many of you noticed the sentences which read, a bipolar, or, Bipolars. Those phrases should not have been subjects or predicate nominatives. They should have read a person with bipolar, a person with bipolar 1, bipolar 2, unipolar bipolar disorder. Ladies, a human being is, a human being does. A human being is not a living. I'm going to read something I've written and then one of my favorite poems, really short, right after. So the title of this poem is actually a quote that I heard um, that's really stuck with me. The poem is called, When you think you're on the edge of breakdown, you might be on the edge of breaking through. Pretty simple, work hard and persevere. Not much about it to unpack. So I stuck the quotes in my pocket until one day 
it came back. It found me shrouded in darkness on the very edge that it described. This time it was taunting me as I stared a breakdown in the eye. I laughed at my own tears because I saw no breaking through, and I cursed the quote I once enjoyed, for now I knew it was untrue. In that moment I was angry, I had myself deceived, I trusted so foolishly that I could find a warm reprieve. And I trod on in that darkness, covered in thick cloud, searching for the way out my mind would not allow. Without rhyme, I continued forward towards the edge I thought was before me, but it did not grow nearer. I struggled, but continued to work hard and persevere, and over time, through moments of clarity, they led to shifts in the way I viewed the world, in the way I viewed myself, and whatever darkness that had been surrounding me was gone. And without that darkness, I could see so clearly and so obviously that all along, what I thought were broken pieces and stumbling blocks were, in reality, building blocks and stepping stones on which I walked out of that very darkness. So as I stood, grateful in the light, I took lots of time to reflect, and again I laughed and cried because, of course, the quote had been correct. So now, if you'll allow me, I'll send it off with you. When you think you're on the edge of breakdown, you might be breaking through. And I'll share one more little one. So this is um, a piece by one of my favorite poets, Wendell Berry, called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Our next reader is Deborah Becker. Those anxious, it said, even with dull, walls closing in all around me, I say, where do I go next? How to get out to say? I hear a voice around me. They surround me, drown me, to say, don't worry, child, you will be all right. A voice offers a guidance, a counsel, and comfort, and then I ask, who's the voice, I say, telling me things? What's inside, comforting me, telling, assuring me about the rightness of everything? It's the Lord guiding, setting me free. In the deep, dark nights, I am found in the end of my day, lying in bed, restless, and I was down on my knees before bed, praying breathlessly, yet I lay still with many thoughts going around my head. And even though I search, I scream, I rage, Days remain anxious. I'm always delighted to introduce the next reader, who is Susan Budig, the co-host of the evening. Susan is someone I know for quite a time now, and we've collaborated on a few things and talked poetry uh, for a very long time. So Susan, welcome. The first poem I'm going to read, The Truth of Dementia. Oh. I don't believe we've met before. Your face does not remind. To hold your hand, I'm disinclined. And yet your key fits in my door. You're not familiar, though you implore that our hearts were once entwined. Your face does not remind, nor does your voice restore. Remembering an old dance floor, 
A man your height does spring to mind, but the image fades, my mind unwinds. The tales you tell are all folklore. I don't believe we've met before. <laughs> Interviewing my aunt, she was born in London, England in 1929, and she lived through World War II there. And it segued into something else that's definitely not about her, but about, well then I was reading about that, um, some of you will be able to correct me, but the K Kennedy daughter who ended up having a lobotomy. And so I was, all these things were in my head and I wrote, lobotomy of a rare and beautiful pink dolphin. My mother used to tell me stories about how she would hide under her desk at school while sirens screamed and teachers panicked. In the distance, Messerschmitts cut through the clouded air like a knife through white frosting on her 12th birthday cake. My mother told me once about a pink dolphin she saw in the dirty Thames while standing on Franklin Street. A bobby shouted, stand back, it might bite. <clears throat> and once she saw a blue lobster, she lived here in Massachusetts by then, and her hair had grown out into a nice bob, not like it is now, shaved by a surgeon who didn't understand about beautiful pink dolphins. Although there's one now in a Louisiana ri river swimming, Emerald green quarries nibble the skeletons of spent piranha, nimbly picking over the bones as if they were seamstresses ripping out stitches, just like the ones on my mother's head. The next reader we have is Jim McDonough. Yes, he is our videographer as well. Yeah. Jim. My name is Jim McDonough and I'm a board member of the St. Louis Park Friends of the Arts and I just want to say we're overwhelmed tonight with this turnout on behalf of Diane and Jamie. You know, this is really a wonderful thing for the community. I've been on the board since 2009. I'm also the uh, board chair of the Park Theater Company, St. Louis Park's Community Theater. This poem, which was the size of a 3M post-it note, fell out of a book. It's entitled, Sometimes, by Sheena Pugh. Sometimes things don't go, after all, from bad to worse. Some years, Muscatel faces down frost. Green thrives. The crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. A people sometimes will step back from war, elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they were born to be. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. <clears throat> May it happen to you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Our next reader is Diane Steen Hinderly. And I think there's um, something emerging now that's called nature deficit disorder that they feel a lot of our children have. And I know when I was growing up, my parents always were taking me to parks, even national parks. And I've lived here in, in the park for 35 years. And I used to see kids playing a lot out in their yards. But we kind of got concerned about safety a lot. But now it's not just safety, but kids are indoors, I think, um, with their handhelds. And whether it's a computer or, you know, the smartphones or whatever, so we have to consciously get our kids out. It needs to be a conscious step. This little site in St. Louis Park isn't just nature, but it's also history and it's also landscape art. So, um, and I just have to say that tonight for the first time, I'm gonna call this site the rock, because it's a rock garden, and it's on this, um, it, it, that's the north-south trajectory, but it's also um, the partner of the Beehive and the Nordic Wares, so that's rail history there. So I call it, I'm calling it the, 
rock and rail garden. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and the rock and rail garden is needing a push. It lies to our west, but is east of the wall, the sound wall on the highway, that lies by Highway 100, and both serve us all. One's more for commerce, the other more fun. One gets out, or gets our tax funds, but the other's on the run. Please give it a thought on Earth Day and shovel. Um, it's art, history, the environment, and shouldn't have to grovel. <laughs> Our next reader is Mike Golfin. I, uh, <clears throat> you heard from Jeannie Wolf earlier. Jeannie and I worked together on a, a show that's kind of in a nascent stage, but we did just tape our second episode. It's called We Need to Talk. But it's a, it's a cable show. You'll, you'll be able to see it in St. Louis Park. And if you live somewhere else, you can see it there too. Uh, but but I'm, I'm really happy to be here because I like, I like the idea of this melding of, uh, of mental health and of course the arts. Um, I should tell you that my mother, uh, like me, was lifelong depressive, so I got so much from her. Uh, but it wasn't just a depression, she had a great sense of humor, and also she was a very theatrical person. So I just kind of feel at home here. Um, my mom, uh, I always said that my mom uh, was a big fan of it, it really, really enjoyed the, what I called the, her name was Ravina, the Ravina Gelfand, the twin masks of drama, which were tragedy and despair. And, uh, <laughs> growing up as an impressive, I just say this as a prelude to, to the poem, uh, you know, I didn't know much about it. It's funny, you can be depressed all your life, but not, not know much about it. And one day, one day I went to, to see my uh, doctor, the old family doctor, and uh, I said, you know, I just, I, I, just, I, I don't feel good, you know, I, something's wrong. I, like, you know, I'm just tired all the time and, you know, not sleeping and described my symptoms. And he said, look, um, sit down, boy, chick. I'm going to talk about this with you. And he said, uh, somebody knows the word, that's good. And uh, so, so he said, look, uh, here, here's the thing, you know, you're suffering from depression. And, uh, it's not, and I just want you to know, it's, it's, you know, he said it's nothing to be ashamed of. You, know, you don't have to feel like it's your fault. It's just an illness, you know, like syphilis or gonorrhea. <laughs> Describing in a nutshell. This, uh, this process that I went through, trying to find some kind of medication that would help me. And it was a long and arduous process. And, uh, but it, it ended, I won't say happily, but it, it ended uh, maybe some, with some stability, I guess. So uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't remember that you're supposed to have a name for the poem. Uh, I'll call it uh, Pharma, us Pharma. I like one words because I have a short attention span. Um, so th this is it. I'll, I'll pause. There'll be a, there'll be a uh, short intermission. <laughs> no. Go get something to eat. Call for help. Whatever it is you do. Uh, deep in the abyss, I tasted the black bile. How it came to this, I could not reconcile with my expectations of eternal bliss. I felt the shame, it's what we do. I was being punished for my sinful path, so I looked at my past for a clue. It was lust for sure, and certainly wrath, but I couldn't even narrow it down to a few. So I made an appointment with the wise Dr. Klein. He said, don't worry, son, your troubles are over. Just look here at the cover of time. Pause briefly for an annotation. <laughs> this was the mid '80s when Prozac was on the cover of Time Magazine. I know many of you are old enough to remember that, and many of you are probably old enough to have forgotten about it too. And that's okay. So, 
where was it? Just look at the cover of Time. Take these SSRIs. You'll be sitting in clover. Now get the hell out. I've got four more in line. So I took my script to the all-night drugstore and put my hopes and trust in Big Pharma. Sure, they gouge and they lie, and they always want more of your cash and your savings. Hell, it's bad karma. But I didn't care because I'd be saved for sure. So for weeks I waited and waited while I paced without sleep. But I figured all would be well when those pills were titrated. Week one, two, and three, and still I did weep. Till I said, Doc, that stuff is overrated. The years slipped by and I said farewell to Miss Serotonin, who seduced me and left me alone in my own private hell. Now we get into more or less of the clinical part of the poem. <laughs> It's basically just a list of medications that I took. So I apologize. Some of you may recognize some. There's some old standards here. Some maybe not so much. But I'm kind of obsessed with, with you know, pharmacology. Then trazodone seemed fantastic, but it left me priapic. Paxil, perhaps? No, it gave me brain zaps. Remeron seemed sound until I gained 30 pounds. Celexa was fun until it gave me the runs. Then there was Elevil, the soporific pill. After that, Prozac Weekly, which made my alpha man meekly. Until in desperation I turned to a nostrum, disgraced for 30 years spurned. This is a reference to what I take now, which is a tricyclic medication, by the way, which no one takes. And Big Pharma finally figured out it's a generic drug, but they finally figured out that there was this guy in Minnesota who still took this drug, like the only guy probably in the Midwest. So what they did was they raised the price of it five times. <laughs> you got to give him credit for that. And suddenly I felt needed. <laughs> to a nostrum disgrace for 30 years spurned, it was my last best hope, so at any cost and at the end of my rope, to paraphrase the poet Frost, I took the pill less swallowed. <laughs> Our next reader is Angela Griffith. This is something I wrote. Modern woman is somebody's mama too. Woman put the whiskey to her lip. Opening up the desk drawer, she sip, sip, sip. Baby's in the cradle in childcare, safely snug. Mama's on the whiskey on career entry run. Bottles in the filing cabinet, bottles in the bin, bottles in the desk drawer make the day begin. Baby only four weeks old, hatched and dispatched, has a dad at Honeywell, the big defense plant. Mama gets up early, drops the baby off, picks the baby up again at five on the dot. Stops off at the market, stops off at the store. Drives home along the free freeway, cooks, cleans, and mops the floor. Bathes the baby, beds the baby, then does the washing up. Has a screaming fight with hubby, tells him, tells her, tells her, tells him, and both tell both, shut up. Mama gets up early, drops the baby off, has to pick him up again at five on the dot. Woman puts the whiskey to her lip, opening up the desk drawer, and she sips, sips, sips. Our next reader is Deborah Bowling. <laughs> I suffer chronic, chronic pain and many other ails. This winter I began to get me down. I couldn't let it, wouldn't. These words came to me as quickly as I could write them. My reflection. My love I set you free, free to love, to be loved, to accept love, free to follow the wind, the wind that blows and speaks to the sun that shines and spreads its rays through the clouds and to the horizon. As it sets upon the sea, 
I feel your presence as the water falls from the sky and I offer myself to the earth who says, not now, not yet, there's much, there's much that I must show to you. There's much for you to learn and there is much more for you to share. Continue to see the trees to keep them near you. They are your spirit guides. Gaze upon the trees, touch them, breathe with them. They are your energy, they are your strength. The trees feel the sun as it's, excuse me. <laughs> Pretty heavy, <laughs> truth, okay. Continue to see the trees to keep them near you. They are your spirit guides. Gaze upon the trees, touch them, breathe with them. They are your energy, they are your strength, the trees. Feel the sun as it heals, as it nourishes your body. Feel its warmth, its light will empower you. Do not despair the clouds as they pass through the sky, for the water that they carry may unburden you, as the rain that falls upon the world refreshes and enlightens, cleansing the world, brings peace and love as it encircles and it connects your past, your present, and your future life. Eleanor Goddard is our next re reader. That's me. Hi. So I recently, this summer, I came back from two years living in West Africa. This is now my perspective on America um, now that I lived away for two years. Where in West Africa? Um, Ghana. I loved it so much. I wish to go back there very soon. Take me out of this urban lifestyle. It's killing me inside. We are all trapped here with no place to move. We all coincide. America is like a bubble that people are too scared to leave. But if you just take one foot out, you'll find elegance you can't even believe. They take quantity over quality, which leaves me screaming. The future of this country good, you must be dreaming. Food is bought on plastic trays made by chemicals and parts of rats. We've gone in too deep. We don't intake ha happiness, we intake fats. With houses so big, they have destroyed the country's beauty. We think we're so advanced, but we have forgotten our world duty. I'll only touch on this lightly because I'm sure you've heard quite a bit. With shooters potentially everywhere, our country has dramatically split. Strangers think America's the dream when other countries provide better opportunity. We are all man-made, nothing's real, we have no actual unity. I loved opening up my windows in the morning, seeing everything so active. Now I see stillness, deadness, nothing as attractive. People are put into fake groups, friends and ideas they don't even like. The most famous and popular people lead the country. I'm ready to go on strike. Everyone always seems in a hurry and running around everywhere, but we overwork our people. These people have limits, we must be aware. We kill living things so they provide an aesthetic. Our objects are more valuable than animals, how pathetic. We don't realize that there are people in this world struggling to just make a dollar. These people work just as hard as us the amount of privilege just smaller. I can't stand this anymore. Someone please take me home, or at least to a nicer place in which I can roam. The reader that I have listed here is Dan Takarara. What I always love about these events is how people's voices become clear and there are so many different perspectives um, that we hear in one room. So, still on the theme of mental health, um, I became a grandmother a few years ago. I'm very interested in watching little kids and how they behave. It's really nice to be a little more objective. They're not mine. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of fun. Anyway, this, this poem is called The Matter of Owie Songs. The toddler 
age two, is tired of rooster songs and ditties about pigs that oink and cows that moo. The toddler, age two, asks for an owie song. He sports his share of scrapes and dings that mar sheer skin unblemished before this time of unanticipated tumbles followed by hot tears and the consolation of cartoon band-aids. In his evolving tale of trial and error, this is chapter one, his own song, so like the sad songs of lament, chagrin, regret, the adult cuts and bruises to come. Let me tell you my sorrow, let me tell you. We owie early, Humpty Dumpty and all fall down. The cry we make trumps a moo or an oink any day. or a moo any day. I should have dropped a voice. <laughs> um, there were a series of poems when I was looking for poems that intrigued me because I thought they were about people and in a lot of ways they represented, uh, how can I say it, a kind of self-learning experience for me. When I write, I always learn something about myself. I think we can all say that, those of us who write. You find out something that you didn't know. And um, I wrote a poem about a man I worked with who I truly thought was a little bit of a lunatic when I met him because he was, he was so fanciful. And anyway, in the end, he changed my life. He taught me to play, taught me to be more creative. It turned out to be a very great friendship. So the name of this poem is Learning. I never noticed alligators or purple or fishing as a passion until I met you and you turned my eye. I didn't even want to look toward the preposterous accumulations somewhere between nature and plastic perched in all points of your office. Your propensities, so different from mine, made me snort that supercilious sort of art over the mundane huff. Such bad taste, such childishness I breathed in. But everywhere you touched, there was purple and passion, tickling to the fingertips with your obtuse visions, sending crinkles of electricity, shades of play and whimsy in every direction. You molded your merry constructs and gave them away generously. In this way, there came a moment when I knew that some secrets present froggy green and that purple is not one color, but many. Writing poetry a lot more often, I kind of use it as an outlet towards like my mental illness <coughs> issues and stuff. <coughs> Why doesn't anybody understand me when I'm sad? Not like the on the surface kind of sad, but the kind of sad that twists your stomach muscles into knots and makes you feel sick. The kind of sad where you don't want to do anything or go anywhere, where all you want to do is lay in bed and stare at the ceiling in silence because you don't feel like there's anything better to do. Because you feel like you aren't worth anything to do something. And then come the days when the angel and the demon reside in your mind. The angel, the warrior, the energetic, the demon, the darkness, the heavy feeling in your chest and the loss of motivation. Having one is tough, but having both is absolute hell. And when they finally go away, the sadness is still there, lingering on the fact that you haven't eaten properly, that you've slept too much. God, you feel like such a mess, like failure. And you wonder then, at that exact moment. Does anyone actually care? So this is a spoken word that I wrote for a creative writing class a little while ago. And yeah, it's about um, perfection. I don't think I can write spoken word. I try to express my thoughts on paper, but my brain says you can do better. I think too much and write too little. I have too many thoughts to process, and when I finally settle on one idea, I then see its fallibility. I guess I'm just afraid of failure. My head and heart are always fighting, especially when I try to escape through writing. 
My thoughts get clouded. They change shape and bounce around and I'm never quite sure what path to follow. The path of least resistance or the path of greatest persistence. Go big or go home, they say. They don't realize what effect it has on people. They're telling you to break your back in an effort to achieve something great or it's not worth your while. Practice makes perfect, they say. What they don't understand is that perfection is a disease. It fogs your head and renders you incapable to accept anything less than the best. Perfection is said to be just a concept, but it's also a huge wall, looming over you and stopping you from accomplishing your dreams. Perfection is a monster, accepting a select few, except for you. It chews you up and spits you back out, telling you that's not good enough. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, they say. Your, gre your greatest enemies are the ones beside you, always inside you, telling you to do better or you're going to fail. You're getting put down, beat down to the ground. You try to rise back up, only to succumb to the pressure and try to write the final paper first. There's always room for improvement, they say. There's always room to get better, so you can't be proud of what you've completed so far. You'll never be satisfied with better than average. You must be the best. But there's simply no way to get there. So this hopeless quest to overcome improvement gnaws at your brain, pulling you around like a marionette and never fully going away. But you still reach for the other side of the gaping black hole, aiming for perfection. You take a running jump, but you can never lunge far enough. Nobody can. So once again, you tumble down this never-ending pit with the echoes of what if. I need poetry as an outlet for things that I'm feeling. Sometimes I feel like I'm living a dream. Sometimes I hear things that shouldn't be seen. There's a fine line between live or die, even if that line may be a lie. When you struggle through the days, everything clouded with a haze, why am I able to smile? able to be happy for a while. How is that fair? Why can't we share? The good and the bad, the happy and the sad. And I shouldn't be complaining about things less straining, but I'm still allowed to feel, even if my hurt heals faster than yours, while you sink through the floor, thinking you are unnoticed and alone, but in you I have found a home. <laughs> um, the fatigue sinks into my bones, plunging, plummeting, falling like a stone. I try to stand, I try to rise. A hand is offered, but instead I save my pride. I am from two homes, from the back and the forth, from the smart and the strong. I am from the anger hidden behind ice cream on the porch, from the blinding sun and my mother's blinding smile. It made my skin burn and my heart sore. I am from the large cherry tree of which I fell out as a child, too old for me to admit. The long oak whose large branches stretched across the second floor bathroom, now torn down from the roots, just like my old home. I am from the revolving apologies from Dad and the comforting arms from my mother, from Anne and Andy who can no longer stand to be around one another, and Jack, my strong brother who I began my life beside. I am from the boisterous laughter filling the table, my mother's never-ending laughter, and the dense small talk at the other, my stepmother's thin smiles. From the I'm sorry, I don't mean to make you cry, and the your father loves you, he just doesn't know how to show it. I am from the attempts at going to church and my mother's restlessness when my, me and my brother resisted. From all over Europe and right here in my heart. From the black bean soup, dirty rice, and the chocolate and peanut butter rice crispy cake. From Grandma Pat, with the wigs to make up for the hair she lost, and my mother's tears, she was gone too soon. And my older brother Luke, lost and drowning in a world too big for him. I am from the tears, the joy, the broken, the curious, the anger, the laughter, the hurt, the resilient, and the comfort. I am from the loving family and the one that tries his best. I am from the strong heart and the passionate mind. And the reason I'm up here again is because all of you high school people or younger people are here. And it drew me up here. It's a short poem that I wrote when I was a senior in high school. By that time, I had gone to the hospital four times for approximately two to three weeks at a time. I still graduated first in my class. I knew I was a perfectionist, and that's what they thought I was, a perfectionist. And it was all environmental. I was not diagnosed with a, what I can thankfully say now, was a useful label until I was 27 years old. <clears throat> this is entitled Pastoral Lyric. 
I wanted to have you all close your eyes for this option. And when the world upon your shoulders lies, and burdens come where satisfaction starts, lift up those hearts and soothe your searching eyes, makes dreamy thoughts much like the parts of crumbled roses melting to connect lost hearts. No other annoyance, nor people's begging please, P-L-E-A-S, will turn you from your destined hearts or cause you pain. But as virtue slowly nods, she'll assure you <laughs> you're in that silence, far from heartless gods. And what I want to say about perfectionist, perfectionism is I'm a recovering perfectionist, and I'm doing so well, you should see my house. <laughs> <laughs> a poem in your pocket, because it is National Poem in Your Pocket Day next Thursday. So take a poem, stick it in your pocket, and then find an appropriate place to read it on Thursday. <laughs> For the past many, many, many years, I have worked with refugees and immigrants who come into the United States. And um, <laughs> as teacher, as planner um, of adult education ESL programs. So a lot of poems I write are about that topic. And I, I guess I'm spinning off the person who read about, who was talking about Ghana. So this is perhaps a flip side of that coin. This poem is called Blue Lufa. I think you all know what a lufa is. It's that scrubby thing that comes, you know, plastic. Um, Blue Lufa. Down the aisle from where I'm perusing soaps and powders, the man I dub as Ethiopian fingers an item made of layered plastic mesh ruffles. He turns it over several times to inspect it. What is it, he asks. It's for the bath, I explain, my absurd gestures making clear the purpose. The man says, I see, and files this detail in a deep recess I will never see. The man considers once again the many wondrous products he has encountered in his short time here. The stores lined with shelves of unknown peculiarities requiring cl classification confuse him. Amused, he smiles to himself. This is a joke among fellow immigrants, how the need of translation extends beyond language to function. He thinks, as he often does, these Americans invent things far beyond nature's output. But he doesn't say this because he cannot afford to mock. This is the slow way you learn to fit in a new country, absorbing the context of puzzling contents wrapped in noisy cellophane. Mm. Thank you all for coming tonight. We still have a little bit of food left, and I see a few little mini brownies. Do you, Jamie, do you have something you want to say? Jamie is going to wrap this up. Yes, so thank you for, for the reminder. So we have been recording tonight. Um, if you read something that tonight that you would not like included in that recording, come talk to Jim and myself here, and we'll um, make sure that that doesn't get posted anywhere. Um, and, and we can delete it from the footage tonight. Um, so come find us if that applies to you. Um, so again, thank you to Health in the Park um, and to SLP Nest um, for being with us tonight. And um, thank you to everyone who read. Um, if you would like to get involved with Friends of the Arts, um, we have uh, other poetry nights that we'll be doing um, throughout the year. We have a community singing event coming up next month that 
is outdoors, so hopefully we <laughs> will get spring. Um, but uh, we'll have a lot of choirs from schools and churches and synagogues and senior choirs all around St. Louis Park, um, and we'll be singing together. So if you're into singing, um, and there's all kinds of other ways to get involved and share a community like this and get to know St. Louis Park and our neighbors. So um, if you didn't put your email down, sign up for that. We'll send you a note and you can unsubscribe if we bother you too much. Um, and then I think there's signups as well for Health in the Park and um, for the Nest organization. So if you want to support um, the Nest and their efforts to get this building, uh, this space where they can have these kinds of events um, with each other, um, I know that that would be appreciated. Um, and then there's lots of other Health in the Park um, mental health events as well. So if this was helpful for you or you want to be involved in that, be sure to sign up. One more thing from Diane. Um, if some of you would like to have your poems put in the e-newsletter, would you get them to Jamie or how about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sign up and um, um, we can communicate via email. We can um, feature some poems in our newsletter that goes out too. So um, take food on your way out. Um, say hello to people and, and uh, thank you for coming. All right. Six.